Hey gang, how's it going? I'm Todd Nock. Welcome to my latest live art uh, broadcast here. What is that? Okay, that notification's gone. Hey, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for waiting. Uh, for those of you who are waiting here in the room, uh, thanks for, for uh, hanging out as we waited to get things started. And if you're just joining me now, welcome. And if you're watching this after the broadcast, thanks for watching videos here on my YouTube channel. So for today's art live stream, I'm drawing the fourth illustration for the Gabe El Taib comic kickoff party uh, for, um, and that all reads backwards, um, for uh, San Diego Comic Con, San Diego Comic Con preview night, uh, Gabe El Taib, colorist of Young Justice and other DC comics, he uh, it hosts these, um, these, sorry, adjusting that fan there, um, these uh, kickoff parties every year. This is the sixth one. I've been a guest at every every one so far. Gabe and I are the two uh, long timers, uh, as far as six years go, uh, for uh, to benefit the Hero Initiative, the Hero Initiative charity. So hopefully you caught my previous broadcasts, like uh, on, see, on Monday, I drew Gambit. Uh, I think it was Tuesday, I drew Rogue, because if I draw a Gambit, I got to draw Rogue. And then on uh, Thursday, I believe it was Thursday, I drew Cyclops. So again, we're going with this 90s X-Men theme. And don't worry, gang, I will be drawing other characters other than X-Men in future art broadcasts and live streams. I just got this X-Men theme going for uh, these uh, these uh, comic kickoff party pieces. So, And then I got a fourth character here. And I decided to go with Bishop for several different reasons. Um, mainly one, just to show which colors I use when I draw when I color a darker skinned character. Because I've drawn three Caucasian people here, and it's always the same Copic markers. This one here, this illustration here, um, will allow me to use some of them, my darker colors, so y'all can see what it, it looks like when I color like an African American uh, character, like Storm or Luke Cage or. Bishop here, or Cyborg, uh, some of the similar, similar colors to which you might have seen me use in past videos. So enough jibba-jabber, I'll talk more and share more while I draw, share with you my tips and tricks. I will uh, try to answer some questions and respond to comments while I draw, but because so much of my focus is going into sharing the tips and tricks, I'm often going to miss some of your uh, comments and questions, but if all goes well, I should be able to do a, a Q&A at the end of this broadcast. So stick with me, it'll probably be about an hour roughly for the art. And then we'll try to do 10, 15 plus minutes of Q&A, depending on how things go. So I'm going to flip the camera around and we're going to start drawing. So let me readjust the rig here, gang. Now these X-Men pieces will be available to win, either uh, in auction, a silent auction, or in a, a raffle. The previous years have been raffle, but I think Gabe said this year we might be doing silent auction. All the money that is raised, whether it be through auction or raffle at the party, uh, at, at basic uh, bar and pizza, 21 and over, uh, free entry, in case that wasn't mentioned, um, all the money raised goes to benefit the Hero Initiative charity. And you can find more, out, more about uh, the Hero Initiative at heroinitiative.org or just search Hero Initiative. They're also on all the social media. So uh, this is a nine by 12 uh, piece of Strathmore Bristol board. I think that's roughly a, maybe a five by seven image area that Gabe has allowed for us to use there uh, to illustrate. So um, let me push the camera in just a little bit. And um, yeah, so this is essentially smooth Bristol board, which is what I do all my illustrations on. They work great for me for pencils, inks, and Copic color. Uh, not watercolor. I prefer not to, to do watercolor on smooth Bristol board. I use actual Strathmore watercolor paper. So, again, starting off with my uh, trusty rusty Pentel Twist Erase uh, mechanical pencil, 0.5 uh, lead, HB softness. So, uh, I'm going to start roughing in the shapes here. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. So glad you're here. Drawing Bishop from the X Men. So get that basic circle going first. Then from the sides of that circle. Same steps as I did with every other character. This is the foundation. We got to lay down the foundation first. Or at least I like to. I prefer to. Now 
Now, um, Bishop has a bit of a wider face, a bit of a stronger jaw than Gambit or Cyclops, who I did just previous, the previous two or three uh, broadcasts. Eye line halfway from the top of the head to the chin. Nose line halfway from the eye line to the chin. Mouth line halfway from the nose to the chin. Roughly. Roughly. Will I only be drawing X-Men characters? Just for these four. Just for these four. I'm going to start mixing it up with other characters in future li art live streams. Uh, this was... Uh, I chose X-Men for th these four. Uh, mainly because... Um, one, I love the X-Men. Uh, two, um, I, the, the, my X-Men drawings tend to um, be pretty popular at these... Uh, my X-Men and Spider-Man drawings tend to be pretty popular at these uh, parties here. Uh, a pretty desirable character. So I've drawn Harley and Supergirl for previous parties. Um, I thought to go with a uh, um, an X-Men theme, so that's why I've been drawing a lot of X-Men here lately. But I will be drawing other characters. Marvel, DC, maybe even maybe some Ninja Turtles at some point. So more different characters are coming. I know I've been drawing a lot of X-Men here on my channel of late. Uh, I appreciate everyone's support for all that. But uh, yeah, it won't always, always be X-Men or Spider-Man characters. I will mix it up here real soon. So just uh, double checking my, my guidelines. A bit of the side of the head right there. Start to rough in the eyes, almond shapes. Roughly the, the, the space between the two eyes should be like a third eye. So whatever size you make that almond, add a one in the middle and then the other eye. This kind of starts to give us the bridge of the nose. Let's go ahead and drop in some eyebrows here. Some thick eyebrows. Hairline oftentimes is halfway from the eye line to the top top of the head. Bishop's hair kind of comes a little bit, has a little bit more of a forehead, and his hairline recedes just a bit. So I adjust accordingly. So I'm gonna rough in that hairline. Then down the sides to the ear. Ear is uh, eyebrow to nose line. So we're gonna drop in some ears there. Now, as I mentioned before, same mentality every time is know where the top of that skull is. Know where that full skull is so that when you're putting the hair on, you're putting the hair with body on top of that skull. So you don't cut off where that skull might be. And as hair pulls back to some sweet curls that flow down the back. I create these chunky shapes and then intertwine some, some coils inside those chunky shapes. So as you can see, it continues to tighten up bit by bit. Let's tighten up these eyes a little bit. Drawing in the top eyelid down to the center to that little tear duct. Just uh, slowly sketching in the necessary details, bit by bit. Arc those eyebrows. Furrow that brow a little bit. Let's, uh, start to get the nose. I usually like to start with kind of a little bit of a diamond shape. A little wider of a nose for for Bishop. The nostrils here. Kind of put a little art arch right there in the uh, bridge of the nose. Rough in the bottoms of his uh, eyelids.
Start to put in some canals here in the ear. Widen his neck a little bit. Neck muscles right there. Coming down to his shoulders. He's got that one strap on this side, I believe. Actually, he's got straps on both sides, I think, because he has those guns. In fact, we'll put even, even put in one of his rifles here behind him. Just a little extra detail. He's got his red neckerchief, which I already started to rough in. Right, kind of how it bunches up and folds. Okay, now, oh, now I've got to make sure I get his, all his hair flowing back here in just a moment. Now for his mouth. Oh yeah, let's see. From the center of the eye, bring the, these lines, these guidelines down. Help me to find the, the edges of his mouth. A little teardrop to the lip there, give him nice full lips. Bottom lip. A little circle there to kind of rough in where the chin is, will be. Kind of bring the jaw down a little bit. Make sure he gets a nice, wide, strong jaw. So I'm keeping in mind the shapes of the face. I want to get those basic shapes in. And these are all just guidelines that will set me up for the inking. So, um, for the choices I'll make for the inks. Because I will not use every line sketched here for the inks, as y'all have seen in my previous videos. All of this is foundational work that is just informing me on what choices I will make when I go to the next stage of line art. Whether it be tighter pencils or uh, or inks, see, so start to rough in his facial hair. He's got his goatee, so just give him a nice serious mouth here. He just came in from the future. He's got a job to do, and we pull down the sides. And then I arc this facial hair. As I mentioned before on Gambit, I love drawing facial hair. It's so fun to uh, to put in that, that sort of hair texture. So I, I, I'm going in an arc here to show that shape of his chin. These lines here are informing the shape. I'm going to pull a few hair, pull some hair up here towards the bottom, of, the center of the bottom of the lip of the chin. Bit of a sideburns there on the side. Okay, I still have to make sure I get those luscious locks flowing in the background here in just a moment. Trivia question for you viewers here. We'll see, see uh, who, who, who knows their X-Men history. Who created Bishop? What was the name of the artist that designed and created Bishop. Do y'all know? Without Googling it? Without Googling it. Oh, Masked Racer, Wills Portacio. That's correct. Wills Portacio created Bishop back in 1991 or 92. It's probably closer to 91 since he helped found Image in 1992. Do y'all know the name of the two partners that came to the, the present with Bishop? Do y'all know the name of Bishop's two, two buddies that came with him from the future? Part of the X-Men's Xavier Security Force. No, not Forge, not Cable, no. No, no, Cable's from a different timeline. 
I believe it's a different timeline. He's definitely working on his own, I believe, at that time. Now, a bishop came from a from a future where there was an X-Men security force. Now, in, in later stories, they might have established that Cable and, and Bishop had known each other somehow in the future. And with all the time hopping and dimensional hopping Cable has done, I would be surprised if he's encountered Bishop. I can remember one of his buddies' name, but I'm blanking on the second one. I'll know it when I see it. So, without Googling it, can anyone answer without Googling it? Oh, no, now I remember it. Now, now I remember both of their, their names. I'll give you a hint. They're actual people's names. They're not superhero names. His sister and another guy. Now, his sister did show up later, but she didn't show up when he first showed up. She showed up uh, later. And another trivia question. Do you know Bishop's sister's name without Googling it? No Google. We're relying on your honor. His sister was Char. That's right, Master Racer. That's right. Shard is his sister. All right, now time to rough in the uh, the uh, his luscious lock here. Jason, LOL, no clue. No, Jason was not one of uh, Bishop's two buddies. I'll give you a little bit longer to guess. And if you're watching this after the live broadcast, feel free to reply with your answer in the comment section below. Forge, no, no, Forge was here in present day, present day X-Men. He is not from the future. Have I watched the new Spider-Man movie? No, I haven't had a chance to go see it yet. I plan to go see it either this weekend or early next week. So please, no spoilers, everyone. Uh, but I do look forward to seeing Far From Home. Trevor? No, no, Trevor is not. Uh, that was one of the first names that came to mind when I was trying to remember uh, his buddy's names. Trevor Fitzroy was one of the villains that was uh, in the uh, that was giving the X Men a hard time there in the early '90s. So my my uh, memory was defaulting to Trevor at, at first as well. Um, so I don't blame you there. I was right there in that same boat. Uh, but no, not Trevor, not Trevor. But it's kind of along those lines a little bit. Do you just want me to give you the answer? I'm sure those who are watching post-broadcast have probably already commented with their answer in the future. It's kind of weird here doing live streams. Yeah, y'all want me to give you, give you the answer? Okay. His two buddies' names were Malcolm and Randall. Malcolm and Randall were um, Bishop's two buddies who on, on the Xavier security force that came with him from the future. Now, I, don't, I can't recall what the final fate was for Trevor, Trevor and Randall. Uh, I mean, Malcolm and Randall. You looked it up, but still not Malcolm and Randall? Huh? No? I'm pretty sure it's them. That's why, that's why I remembered reading, I thought. I think one was a Caucasian dude and the other was a Filipino dude. I'll have to look, uh, Google uh, Bishop's first appearance and, and see what... Uh, or I should just message uh, Wills and say, Hey, Wills, was Bishop's two buddies uh, Malcolm and Randall? Oh, it, it is. What? It is? What? Oh yeah, I forgot. I need to put the M on his eye here. Start with both sides of the M. Thanks so much. Almost forgot a key detail here on Bishop. I was wondering what what's missing here. What is, what am I lacking? That says M. A little bit of the point of that middle M coming right down here. And Bishop's M, everyone who gets the M tattoo on their eye, their mutant tattoo on their eye, it's always their right eye. And remember, if you're going to cosplay as Bishop, remember that the mirror does not do photo reverse. So 
If you do what looks like the right eye in the in the mirror, you're actually doing your left eye. I've seen some some cosplays that had the M on the wrong eye because they did it in the mirror and didn't take into account it's not a photo um, left to right, but a re reversed left to right. So you always have to keep that in mind. All right, so this is some pretty tight details here. Five tips for beginners. Uh, for beginning artists, um, we'll say, uh, assume that means uh, beginning comic book artists. Uh, one, try to take art classes, whether it be in school or in your community. Uh, some, some instruction can help. Look into how to draw books, especially how to draw comic books uh, type books, like how to draw comics the Marvel way or the Wizard Magazine series of books, or just any other book will be fine. Uh, they, they tend to give the building blocks. Um, one, uh, practice, well not one, but I guess three, practice, try to draw every day if you can. Uh, have fun. That's a tip that people don't think about so much, is have fun. Enjoy the process. Know that it will be, art is challenging. It's not always easy. It is oftentimes frustrating as we're learning, and to not be discouraged by that. So find the, find the fun in it, uh, so that uh, you're motivated to keep drawing. Uh, so that you don't stop and give up. Uh, it's okay if you've given up and, and, and think, oh, I, I can't do it anymore. I'm, I'm just going to give up. It's just too hard. That's okay. Those are normal feelings. Remember, you're always welcome to start back up again. So if you ever quit out of frustration, remember, you can come back. Try to get started again as soon as you can. And... Uh, Let's see, those, those, those would be some, I, I can't remember if I'm at four or five there, but those are some of the, the, some key ones. Try to take art classes, whether it be in school or local community stuff. Um, look into uh, how to draw books can give you some good foundational tools, especially if you can't go to a class. Try to have fun as much as possible and keep drawing as much as possible. So, these are some fairly tight pencils for uh, for a live stream here. I usually don't go quite this tight, but I don't often get to draw bishops. So I wanted to make sure I got those details in the way I wanted them to be. So that was that was pretty key for me. So now it's time to go to inks. So I'm going to start with my Pigma Micron 08. It's always that's my go-to go-to inking tool, and we're just going to start dropping in the uh, the um, the details here. I'm going to pick the final lines. Someone just, I think I, I just missed the comment, but I think someone was confirming about Malcolm and Randall, that, that they were his buddies that, um, that uh, he debuted with in, in Uncanny X-Men. Appreciate the uh, confirmation. What was that Kenny X-Men issue number? I'm so sorry, I missed it. So now I'm just picking those selected lines. I'm gonna spin the paper here just to get the right angle, the correct angle to drop in these lines here. I want to start to define the shapes of a bishop that I that I want to translate. I'm going to start to work on this M next. In fact, yeah, I'm not going to use that French curve. I'm going to let this be a little bit more organic in the lines. I was going to use a French curve. I've decided against it. I didn't want it to look too sterile, too uniform. I wanted it to look a little bit more natural on his face. Mm. 
now to fill in the uh, eyebrows here. So I'm leaving a little bit of a halo from the eyebrow hair to the M, so it gives a sense of kind of the, the scarring would kind of have the eyebrow hairs aren't growing in as as full. This will be Copic Colored, gang. If you just tuned in, I will be taking this to Copic Color. So I put a little bit heavier of a of a line for the top eyelid, but a little bit lighter underneath because of the light. Again, the light's coming from above. Again, I'm saying, again, because in the previous broadcast, I was doing light from above, just kind of more of a generalized lighting, not going with a crazy mood lighting. Maybe someday I'll do a video where we do a, a crazier lighting, maybe a up-angled lighting. Now a little furrow on his brow there. Now a lot of the details and the shaping of his face will come in the color stage. So I'm not going too crazy with the line work here. Do another uh, art challenge in mind of the Todd Knock Art Challenge. I will do. I will offer another uh, Todd Knock Art Challenge here in the in the future, maybe once a month. So uh, so the next Todd Knock Art Challenge, the new topic will uh, maybe I'll do one uh, come early early August. I was already thinking about what are some of the other challenges. Now, if y'all are just tuning in and you're asking what is this Todd Knock Art Challenge, this kind of just kind of. We kind of fell into it here the, with the viewers and I uh, on the previous live stream this week. I'm not sure which character I was drawing. It was one of the previous three, Cyclops. Probably It was probably Rogue, I think, is where it started. Um, where we somehow we fell into uh, the challenge of inviting you artists to draw Spider-Man and a pizza. It could be any Spider-Man character, any p type of pizza slice of pizza, a whole pizza, pizza box, whatever your creativity wants to do. And, um, and then when you post it on, on Instagram, be sure to tag me and use the hashtag Todd Knock Art Challenge. And I've been sharing those on my Instagram story. So i um, got some more I need to share here after this broadcast. So stay tuned. And it's been fun to see uh, people's renditions of Spider-Man and a piece of pizza. So Everyone's welcome to participate. Please draw things that are at least PG-13 appropriate. Uh, those I'd be willing to share. No one's drawn anything, you know, inappropriate. But um, but because of the wide variety of audience, I try to keep things, you know, PG-13 rated at least. Please. Um, but you're welcome to draw whatever you feel. I'm just going to share stuff that is, you know, good for a wide audience. But I certainly don't, not going to tell you what to draw. So anyhow, anyhow, uh, that's, um, that's, that's what that is. That's what the uh, Todd Knock Art Challenge is. A character and an item. Much like my friend Tony G-Man from Heck Guerrero. Uh, you've probably seen me do his mystery art challenges, which are now called the Myster Mysterious Art Combo. And uh, so it's kind of along those sort of lines. It's just you get more time to think about it because you get to do it from your home or your studio or wherever you're, you like to do your drawing. And I have to do it right there on the spot at a convention. So I don't have time to kind of sit where it's nice and quiet and really think through uh, the, uh, the scenario. So as you see, I'm just coming through here and just kind of Picking out the 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 lines I want to um, to express my my take on Bishop here. In fact, we're going to just continue with his hair here. We're just going to. Pulling these hairs towards the hairline. I will be adding some blacks here in his hair to really um, bring in that uh, those dark, 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 chunky shapes. Right now, just getting the the line work in. 
It's got a lot of wave to its hair uh, here on the, the top, which then pulls back to the those beautiful curls that cascade down the back. It has a bit of a receding hairline. According to the reference I was double checking on earlier today. I want to make sure I got as many details right. So right now I'm drawing this all from memory. Memory? <laughs> from memory. Don't know why my voice said it weird there, just memory. From memory. Uh, I read a lot of Bish comics with Bishop in it, but he's changed his costume quite a bit. Uh, so I wanted to go for that classic look, so I just wanted to double check. So I looked at some images of Wills Pertasio's Bishop, John Romita Jr.'s Bishop, saw some Alan Davis Bishop, kind of looked at some of the commonalities of their take on Bishop and just committing some of the details to memory, especially like his hairline, some details of his costume, things like that. So, all right, let's get this other ear now that we've worked our way to the this side of his head. So as y'all can probably see, I'm not, not inking every line that I put down there. A lot of these lines are just the structural lines. Kind of shows me what the full shape is will be, and then I pick the lines I feel are necessary to convey that shape. So some lines, like here, 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 they're not necessarily lines to, to ink. If it did, there'd be a lot of lines on here, as many ink lines as you see pencil lines. And that's not the goal for me. It's to, um, to uh, give myself the structure I need so I can pick and choose the lines I want to convey Bishop. All right, so now we're going to start to work this uh, neckerchief. So, here with the neckerchief, there's a lot of folds in this cloth. Part of it is, uh, you know, working off of memory, what I've seen other artists draw. Another part is just kind of looking at real-life neckerchiefs and how do they fall. How, how do those folds fall? And uh, just kind of, then just kind of creating from my imagination a little bit as well. Actually, quite a bit. these folds, you know, because it all bunches up around his neck. So really studying those aspects, learning the shapes that you'd want to use. Mostly thinking in like triangle shapes, for the most part. How, does, how do they wrap around his neck? How does it fall down his shoulders? Where does it bend and fold? in these places. So all sorts of reference and, and study and allowing myself to uh, just kind of play with it. All right, and then let's see his shoulder straps. as well as shoulders. So I've been doing headshots here because of the amount of space on the board. Uh, a full figure or even a half figure would not have a, allow for a lot of detail. So I've gone for headshots for these boards because the boards they sent, the, the, the live area here is actually kind of small, smaller than what I'd like to do for a, a um, anything more than a, a headshot. If I wanted to go half figure, I'd prefer to have almost the full nine, nine and a half by 12 inch artboard available to me. So these spots will be filled in black. So I'm just putting a little X there as a notification to myself to remind myself 
fill this spot in with black. I'm going to tackle this hair here in just a moment. Just put a little, some little tech details here on his shoulder straps. off this part of his neck here. Little Adam's apple action right there. All right, so let's see. Now for his facial hair. Have I ever used magenta on my reds? Um, I've used uh, some shades of pink. I don't know if I've, I have a specific color called magenta, but I have used different shades of pinks uh, with my reds, depending on the, uh, the effect I was going for. I oftentimes go for oranges with my reds as a lighter color highlight, just because I love the, the, the power and the vibrancy of that orange. But that's not to say I won't use pink. I have... I actually used some pink on, on Cyclops's, the center of Cyclops's visor in uh, Thursday's art stream, episode uh, 021. But more than likely, I'll be using oranges here in the reds of his, uh, his uh, neckerchief, his bandana. Continuing to arc the uh, facial hair around to give the shape and form and mass of his chin. I just don't want to do just straight lines. At least, it's not my preference. Um, and uh, well, I don't want to crisscross the lines. I like, I like to go like go like this to. Uh, A little, little more uh, density of the lines here further down to get uh, on the towards the bottom part of his chin to give a sense of uh, shadow, very subtle shadow. It's almost time. Oh yeah, I still need a lot to finish up there in his hair. As well as those curly locks back behind there. In fact, let's go ahead and start That process. Actually, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it up to the zebra uh, brush pen, the fine-tipped zebra brush pen. We're going to get a different sort of texture here. It's going to really put in some nice chunky dark areas here. So I'm just doing these little curved lines, and these little chunks, curving one direction then the other. Let's add a few more right there. This has taken a lot of practice. And interestingly enough, we were talking about how Wills Protasio created um, Bishop t almost 30 years ago. I was hanging out with uh, Wills at a comic book convention in Florida many years ago, and he introduced me to the Zebra brush pen. He goes, hey Todd, check out these brush pens. They sell them at the Daiso store, buck 50. Look at the line you can get with them. I'm like. Whoa, that's cool. So whenever I use a brush pen, I think of, right, not, not every time I use a brush pen or a zebra brush pen, but whenever I, uh, zebra brush pens, I should, I, I should say, I equate to Will's Portacio. So you see there how it's given a lot of nice body and nice dark chunks. And with the, the, the tip of the brush pen, I can get these nice thick to thins.
Is this the pen that I used when I smudged with when I was doing that impulse for uh, the sci-fi wire? Uh, no, that was a completely different brush pen. I don't even know what that brush brush, brush pen, uh, what brand of brush pen that was. They say brush pen a lot of the times in the same sentence. It can get really difficult to actually say it correctly. Now, zebra brush pens, I'm a bit more uh, familiar with. If you want to see me jack up a drawing, make sure you look me up on the uh, Sci-Fi Wire um, Artist Alley feature on the Sci-Fi Wire YouTube channel. All right, so that takes care of those locks there. We're going to use the same brush pen. We're going to add some uh, darker chunks here to his hair. So mostly focusing on the hairline and pulling towards the outside of the hair. Like that. See what I'm doing there? And following the the curves that I've established that I, with my micron. As a guide. So it's really starting to give his hair and head some nice shape. I'm leaving a lot of this white here, which will come in with some uh, different shades of gray and maybe a little bit of blue to give his hair some some color as it moves from the the black to the highlight of the light source coming down. And in fact, we'll be getting to that color stage coming up here real soon. Almost done with the inking. few more little bits here. There we go. So that takes care of that. I'm going to fill in these little black spots here a little bit later. Now let's see, I am going to use my French curve now to ink his gun. I want to have a nice, crisp, clean line. And this French curve is kind of like using a ruler, but it's for a nice curved shape. So I'm just choosing the angle, the curved angle of the uh, of the French curve that I feel lines up with the pencil sketch line that I've established. Oops, hopefully I wasn't too far off the screen just then, so sorry about that gang. There we go. So this is the, the butt of the rifle that we're just seeing here as the rest of it is strapped to his back. So you see there with that French curve, I was able to uh, get some, some nice clean lines going. Give it kind of that 90s rifle flavor, space, space rifle, 1990. Upcoming creator comic, creator owned comic I'm going to do. Space Rifle, Space Rifle 1990. Okay. You heard it here first. Um, let's add some uh, shine there. Some little reflection, reflective area. So we'll use some silvers in there. Let's put a little darker chunk in here. It's a different texture. So these little detail lines that you see artists do, the way I use those is to uh, convey the direction of the light source and the shape and form of the object that I am inking. The little X there. So I just don't throw the lines all willy-nilly unless I want it to look old and battered. But I want this to look all slick and sleek and futuristic, more so than battered. So, um, so I'm keeping the lines very uniform. 
and they have direction and meaning. They're not just placed all haphazardly. That, was, that would not be my intention or goal. Okay, so now it's time to erase. So I'm gonna use my uh, kneaded art gum eraser here. I like using this because um, uh, I, uh, it allows me to um, erase without pulling up too much of the laid down art lines. Let's see, I saw someone post, when I work off a comic script, do I, uh, do I thumbnail sketch the entire story first? Uh, yes, yes I do. I thumbnail the whole story first. And then once that's done, I go into penciling it. So just refreshing my, uh, my uh, eraser here. So now I can come in and gently pull these lines off, of these extra pencil lines off the page. Now this is one of my favorite parts. It's almost like a magic trick. I've sketched in all the, these lines and now I've created all my shapes. And now as I start to pull those lines off of the board, I start to see the, the finished inks reveal the shapes that I wanted to convey. It's almost like a fog is lifting. Just taking away that pencil fog. Pencil fog is another name of a creator owned story I plan on doing. It's also the name of my band back in high school, my garage band, Pencil Fog. First album was called Space Rifle 1990. Which as a kid who went to high school in the 1980s, Space Rifle 1990 would actually be pretty futuristic for me, if only by a couple of years. So now I've erased those lines. I can now go back and make some inking adjustments. Maybe add a little more beef to the line. Maybe thicken some lines up. Okay, so now it is time for the Copic, Copic color. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna start with the hair again. I'm gonna start with some neutral gray. I'm gonna start with a neutral gray five. So I'm gonna pull this neutral gray five from the dark part of the hair towards the top, towards the light, leaving still leaving a little bit more of that white of the board on the board. Going to be using a couple of shades of uh, neutral gray here, as well as some shades of dark blue to create a nice kind of comic book highlight color. You know how you see Superman with blue hair? That blue is to convey the highlight, especially back in the old printing process days before computer printing and computer coloring came about. And they had to just use, cut these different uh, films, these layers of film for each co 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 uh, color, the four color process, uh, which really I don't think is done so much nowadays. So it was the neutral, was that neutral five? That was the neutral six. I'm sorry, gang, that was the neutral six. Now some neutral four. Kind of blend that even further out towards the white. So they'd use the blue. It was a, easier, so it was a good color to communicate black to highlight. I guess technically Spider-Man's costume back in the 1960s was considered red and black and the blue was the highlight of his costume until I got to the point where it became a red and blue costume. If I understand my history correctly, that was what a friend was telling me. So I don't think they were joshing me. I don't think they were 
they were joking. It sounded like they were sharing a legit fact they had learned. So, should double check that, that, that info before I go sharing it, but too late, I shared it. So now I'm gonna come in with some B95. Kind of a grayish blue to pull through this hair here. Is that showing up there? Let me adjust my camera light there. In fact, I can try pushing this in a little closer. So hopefully you can see the detail. It's very subtle. And I'll be sharing the, a pic of this here on my social media later today. So make sure you're following me on Instagram, on, on Twitter. I'm at Todd Knock on both of those. And I will be adding those links to the video description here. And those links are in all of my video descriptions. So you can always find, find my social media links in the video descriptions of all my videos and live streams. I just have to go back and edit it in, which I plan to do a little bit later this afternoon. So this is creating a nice bluish gray to really kind of give a, a nice look to, uh, to Bishop's hair here. And I'll come back in with some of this for his eyebrows and, and goatee after I've done his skin tones, which will be starting right now. So we're gonna start with some E15. So when I'm doing a, a, a character who has, uh, coloring a character who has a darker skin tone, these are some of the skin tones I like to use. So we're gonna work dark to light on this one here. So I'm gonna start with the E15. I'm gonna hit all the, the shadowy places first. And we're gonna, just gonna work our way towards the, uh, the lighter parts of his uh, skin where the highlight would hit. Now I might come in with some slightly darker shades in a moment here, but this is kind of getting the foundation going. I'll probably put a lot of shadow around his eyes because he'll have those red, red energy eyes. So I might have a lot of shadow going around his eyes so those reds really pop out. So I'm basing this all off of uh, the curves and shapes of the, the face. Shapes that I'm used to drawing over and over and over and over and over again. These are just some of the initial shadow shapes. We'll be coming in with some various shades of pink for his lips a little later on, but I want that to go over his initial skin tones. So just doing the skin tones right now. All right, so that's, that's, that's wave one. Wave two would be the E13. In fact, I just re refilled this marker last night, so should be fairly vibrant. So coming alongside a lot of what I've laid down already, just blending all of this together. Still leaving a little more white at the board because I want to come with a slightly lighter shade, the E111, just for some of those highlight areas. So this E13 is almost like my base shade. And so I'm just blending that E15. In with. The other colors. So you can see his face is really starting to take shape now. It's really coming together. So now I'm going to power that down to the E, oops, actually well, a little more E13 right here on his ear. In fact, 
Got kind of with that E17 I was mentioning. I just want a few little darker areas. So this is the E17. Just want his skin a little bit darker in places. All right. Now I'm going to use the E11 to kind of blend this all together. Really get it smooth, smooth some places out and leave some places with some nice hard line chunks like through here. And that really just depends on your preference and what kind of effect you're going for, how, how blended you want certain sections to be and where you want some nice hard cuts. I like to have a little mixture of both. Alright, let's bring in a little bit of pink here. So I'm going to use some R20 on his nose. Just put a little bit there on the cheeks. Some here in his lips, for sure. A lot in the top lip, some here on the bottom lip. Just to give him some life in his features. A little R11. Just to kind of blend that all together a little bit more. All right, let's bring that B, or not B, N. N is the letter I want. N, I'm gonna use some N5 here. Now to put the same similar colors in his eyebrows and goatee like we had in his hair. Some N5, and now we're going to come in with that B95 now, that, that bluish gray. We're just going to fill that out there. Okay, so um, let's do his uniform. Actually, let's, let's go ahead and do his eyes right now. We're going to do his eyes and neckerchief with the same shades of red. So some N27. Just going underneath the eyelid for our darkest shade of red, or a dark, darker shade, more of a, yeah, I'd say a, our primary base red. Now a little power that down just a little bit to the R24. It's very, it's the same family of red. And I'm going to bring in a little orange here, some YR68. Just to give it a nice vibrant punch. Oh, did I say N27? Yes, R97. Sorry, I was thinking of the ends of the neutral gray. I must have said N27 when I meant to say R27. Thanks for catching that. So, uh, so now for his uh, bandana. I'm going to come in with that R27. And start pulling in the wrinkles. So I'm just keeping in mind the shapes of the wrinkles. And if the light's hitting from above, just allowing certain spots to have to stay open white. So I can put some lighter shades in there. So that was the R27. Now for some R24. Just 
just going to blend this all into the to the that from the and just kind of fades out down there Just have a few little spots of white open. And then um, so that R68, or not R, YR68. Just gonna go over all that red with a shade of orange for a nice vibrant highlight. Never, if I ever feel like the orange is too overpowering, I can go back over it with some red and kind of tamp it down a little bit if I desire. That's a great thing about uh, Copic Marker Ink is that it's made to blend. Okay. Now let's, uh, let's hit the yellows of his costume. So we're going to start with the Y13. Same, the same shades of yellow. Hopefully I said the yellows of his costume, not the reds of his costume. The yellows of his costume, same shades I use for Cyclopses uniform. So I see a little spot of, uh, using just some spots here on his eye. I want to just fill in with his skin tone. Just a little too, too much white showing of the board, too much white of the board showing. Just really want to get that full saturation of color. So that's a little E11 right there. So back to the yellows. Now for some Y21. So I've left a little bit of the top of his shoulder pad white and I'm pulling, kind of creating this shadow, shadow and reflected light, highlight, or reflected light, highlight, etc. And now a little Y00 just to pull in a little bit right through there. Blend that down a little bit. Very same technique that I used on Cyclops. So let's color his, uh, actually let's do his bodysuit, then we'll do his rifle. So I'm gonna start with the B05. Now there's some spots here that I will be filling in with black, but that's afterwards. Just cause I don't wanna risk the black smearing or bleeding. So I will fill in these spots with the Pentel Pocket Brush Pen a little bit later after I've laid in the color. Same with same situation here on his shoulders. So that's my dark shade of blue first. Now come in with some B04. Just one step down in the B0 family. Now blending the, I like to go over the previous color with that same, or that next shade. So that's those inks, as I mentioned before, will blend together and create new colors, create new, kind of a nice color effect. Now some B01 for the lightest shade just to blend it all together. Okay, now for his rifle. Again, I have some spots that I will fill in black later, but now it's not that time. We're gonna go with cool gray. Since his hair is neutral gray, we'll go with cool grays to um, make his rifle separate from his Hair just a bit. So I'm going to start with some cool gray six. Just have a nice initial dark shade to the stock of the rifle. Now some cool gray four. And then this chunk, I want that, that silvery sort of look. 
So we're going to start with some cool gray too, I think, is what I want. So I'm leaving some white because I definitely want that white highlight. I'm going to come in with some B triple zero. And go over all those gray shades with this B triple zero. In fact, I'll pull some more blue right there so you see more of the light blue, but then leave that spot white. And that takes care of... Actually, I want to work in a color into there. So um, let's come up with some BG93. It's kind of an army green sort of color. So just pull some of this through the gray here. And it just kind of gives the, the gray a bit of a different texture. It's still mostly grayish, but you see a slight color inside there. That can make it look a little, a little different. All right, so now I need to bring in the, the shadow tones. So I'm going to use some cool grays. I'm going to start with a skin tone using a cool gray 3. And really putting a lot of grays around his eyes there. Really want that that red to pop. So any place, is, if the light's coming from above, all these shadows will be, for the most part, on the bottom side of whatever shapes there are. Under this top lip, because it folds underneath. A little bit across the bottom of the bottom lip. Definitely underneath the chin. Down this side of his face. Inside that ear. Under that cheek there. Definitely underneath the chin. where that muscle pulls from the nose down to the cheek. Definitely want to hit those, make those pretty prominent for a scowling face. Not quite scowling, but a stoic, a stoic face, as Bishop's is right here. A little bit across those, that furrowed brow. Okay, let's see some of this cool gray three through the yellows here. Just right across that shoulder band, shoulder strap, I should say. Let's see, let's come in with a darker shade of gray. We'll use some uh, cool gray four. Cool gray four for his Bandana, hitting the undersides of all these folds. That takes care of that pretty quickly. And now for some shades in the blue, using some cool gray five. Definitely up under that chin, as you see, as I just put those few strokes in there, and now his chin pops off of his neck for a nice 3D effect. Just pulling a line all the way across here for the, the bandana, so it gives a separation from the neck to the bandana, creates a nice 3D effect, an illusion of 3D at the very least. A little bit underneath the bandana here, so it's popping off of the chest. And, um, yeah, let's see. Let's 
I'm going to take that cool gray 4 again. I just want to add a few darker spots to the shadows on his face, like under his eyes, here by the bridge of the nose, under that eyelid there, just to sculpt in a little more, some more hard cuts. Just one side of his lip there. His light's coming above and a little bit. To, I always tend to default to above and to the left just a little bit. To my left just a little bit. Uh, just to create that sort of angle there. Because I put most of the bridge of my nose, the, the, this jawline here is kind of showing the light coming from this direction just a little bit. A little bit darker under that. So just these little cuts can bring a lot, some character and eye candy to your illustration. Put a little bit of this in the top of the eyelid, just under, or on the red of the eye, just under the eyelid, just to create a little subtle hint of depth. And some more under his chin there. Okay, so we're really getting close to the finish here. A couple of other tricks I want to do. Number one, take that Pentel Pocket Brush pen I was referring to, and now fill in the black areas. I have found that going this direction just makes it a lot easier. I don't have to wait for the ink to dry before I can go to color. I can just uh, keep, keep coloring and then just finish this as a finishing move just so that I'm not smearing, you know, I don't risk, I have a, a greater, a lesser risk of, is what I'm trying to say, a lesser risk of smearing of the Copic marker with the, uh, the inks if I do the Copic mark or the Pentel Pocket Brush Pen marker. Ah, let me start that line over again. Where are my cue cards? If I do the Pentel Pocket Brush Pen part last. I don't always have to, and sometimes I don't at all. Uh, sometimes I will totally render it out with, or ink it up with, with the Microns, Multiliners, Zebra Brush Pens, and the Pentel Pocket Brush Pen. But for a, a, a broadcast like this, since I know how long it takes for the, uh, the Pentel Pocket Brush Pen to dry, I don't want to slow our, our broadcast down, our live stream down, by having to wait for it to dry before I can... Um, erase or uh, start in on the Copic color because the Pentel Pocket Brush Pen does take a little bit more time to dry. Okay, so we're almost, almost, almost done. Just a couple of more tricks here. Just a couple more tricks. Notice the spot I forgot to fill in with some B01. So I'm going to very cautiously add that here to the side. I got really close to that, that, uh, Pentel ink that I just laid down, so I'm being very mindful. See some pencil lines I forgot to erase. Now let's see. I need. To, I want to put an outline around him, so uh, he's got an energy power as well. And so I'm going to use. I'm going to use orange. I think it'll tie in nicely with the orange I've done here, and he'll be different from the pink I used on Gambit, the green I used on Rogue, the red I used on Cyclops. Let's go with a nice light shade of orange to give him his pop off of the board. So I'm using the YR12. And I, I think this will be a nice, oops, sorry, nice complementary color to give Bishop a little, little delineation from the white of the board and maintains the design element. I've established with these illustrations. So we're really getting close to being done here, gang, with the art, but there's still the Q&A. So I know I haven't been able to respond to many questions since I've been focusing more on the sharing the tips, trips, and art instruction. So uh, I will answer a handful of questions. I, I'll try to answer as many as I can. I can't promise I can answer everyone's, but I'll definitely answer as many as I can that I feel that I can answer appropriately. So uh, so do feel free to uh, start to queue up your question. When I flip the camera around, we will um, we will make that happen. So um, 
just a couple little white highlight details here. I'm going to use my, uh, what is this called? The Uniball Signo White Gel Pen. I'm going to cut a white line. Oops, I need to, I'm just going to need to get a new one of these. Just had to prime it on a scratch sheet. Just do a little scribble, get the ink flowing. And on the, my right hand side of each line here, I'm going to cut with some white. And it just kind of gives a little nice, cool little ridge texture there. Can you see that there? Gives a nice little ridge texture. And I'm going to take my 08 micron. I'm going to pull the angle of his eyelid down just for a little bit more of a serious tone to his eyes, serious emotion. So just a few little inking tweaks. I do this all the time, kind of make some tweaks as I go. And right in the center of his eye, I'm going to give a couple little highlights for the energy. Just gives his eyes just a little bit of, a little bit of a spark. Again, it's that detail, that eye candy for the viewer. So now I can autograph it. And today's date is July, what is today? Today is July the 13th, 2019. And there's Bishop, everybody. Definitely a lot of fun to draw. So glad I chose to draw Bishop today as my fourth illustration. All right, so let's flip the camera around. We'll do a Q&A and chat here for just a bit. Hey gang, let me readjust the 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 uh, rig here, and we will do a Q&A. How about a, car a character mashup, Carnage and Omega Red? Oh, that sounds interesting. Sounds interesting. Um, yeah, really cool idea. What paper is best for blending? I use Strathmore Bristol Board. Strathmore Bristol Board is my go-to. So um, I, I like that it's a nice thick board. I don't get a lot of bleeding. It works well with the inks and colors. So uh, there's, there's Bishop, our finished Bishop. He'll be posted on my social media, where you can also see Cyclops. Cyclops is on my social media as well. You can see the previous uh, live stream of him here on my channel. And then we have Rogue, Sweet Rogue. And then finally, Gambit. These four illustrations will be uh, up for either raffle or auction at the Gabe El Tayyib Comic Kickoff Party preview night of San Diego Comic Con. All this info is on my social media as well as my website. Where the party is, it's free admission. There's video games stuff. At least I know definitely comics and Funko Pops that will be either uh, that will be raffled off, and and each artist that is going to be a guest at this party. We're each providing four illustrations that will be, I believe, auctioned off, possibly raffled off. So somebody will be going home with, um, with an illustration. And hopefully, if you're a fan of the X-Men and my art, <laughs> and you're at preview night and come to the party, you can be one of the lucky people to snag one of these pieces. So, um, yeah, let's, let's, let me, uh, whoops, that backing board thing blew away. Um, have you ever thought about drawing a video game character like you heard, like if I heard of these Call of Duty Mortal Kombat? Uh, very possibly, very possibly, I, I could be drawing uh, some video game characters in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Uh, what age did I start creating comics? And what did you choose as a subject in college? Uh, I start. I made my first homemade mini comic when I was age four. No, yes, I was fourteen. I was fourteen years old, a freshman in high school. I made my first mini comic. Uh, it was just printer paper folded in half, and I wrote and drew an eight-page comic in like one afternoon, evening. It was so much fun. I knew that day I wanted to do this for a living, so I started to teach myself. I was a kid from the nineteen eighties. If you've seen the show Stranger Things, that's pretty much. My life, I was that age at that time in the 80s, uh, junior high, you know, seventh, eighth grade, ninth grade. So, um, yeah, and then I studied, uh, so I went through school, took art as an elective whenever I could, just a lot of self-study, self, uh, tons of practice, 
uh, reverse engineering comics, just trying to figure out how to tell a story. And um, then that led to, uh, I enrolled at the Art Institute of Dallas where I studied commercial art and graphic design, but I applied everything I learned there to drawing comics. They did not teach me how to draw comics. I had to continue to teach myself and utilize the life drawing classes, perspective classes, design classes, all the classes like how can I utilize this towards comics. I did not want to be an art director. I did not want to be a graphic designer, but it was the school I could get to because uh, I'm from Texas originally. So it was a school I was able to get to and um, and and make happen. So it really paid off for me because I, I got hired by Rob Liefeld to work full time in the industry one year after I graduated art school. So it really paid off for me. Thank you for the question. see was there ever a time that ink from a copic marker would splatter all over the place there have been times where i've overfilled my marker like when i've refilled the marker you can refill these and i put too much ink and i go to the illustration and it pooled it didn't splatter but it pooled a large spot of ink i've ruined drawings or i've made uh, some drawings i've been able to kind of rescue but some i had to start over because it's like ah i overfilled the marker so i keep a scratch sheet of of um, like a comic backing board where I will test out the marker before I apply it to the board to make sure it's not overfilled if I've ever overfilled a, a, a marker. Will I ever do a, a bonus character of the 90s X-Men like the villains such as Magneto, Juggernaut, Apocalypse, Mr. Sinister? Uh, possibly, possibly. Uh, that is definitely possible in, a, in sometime in the uh, future. Can I draw a character in my chibi style on a stream at some point? It's very possible I could draw a chibi someday. We'll see. We'll see about that. Let's see. Scrolling back here, see if I missed any questions. Have you ever thought about doing a how to draw book? I have not at this time, but who knows what the future holds. Any plans to do Baltimore Comic Con? I'd love to be a guest at Baltimore Comic Con. I hear that convention is fantastic. Consider, have I ever considered doing a how to, uh, how to art book, including coloring with sketch markers? Uh, no, I think my videos here are probably more informative and easier for you to uh, follow along because uh, I'm sharing my process. So I think the videos are probably are a bit stronger than actually doing a book at this time. That might change. That is, is, I think is a great idea. Um, and if a publisher ever said, hey, we want you to do this, I would strongly consider it. Absolutely. But right now, I think the videos is... Uh, right now the, the best format for me to uh, share my tips and tricks when it comes to coloring as well as, as how, I, how I art. Can I draw Sabretooth? I, I might do that someday. Do my Micron pens do the same as that, as that Copic splat? No, because the Microns are not refillable. These are disposable. When it's gone dry, I toss it. Uh, sometimes I have bought uh, some Copic, uh, I mean some Pigma Microns and the ink had bled out of the tip into the cap, and um, but it's not really bleeding on the artboard, so I just clean out the cap so I don't have this glob of black ink on the tip. But that's fairly rare for that to happen, but I have noticed that happen in the past. Um, you thought Storm was the next, the fourth character? No, I hadn't committed to the fourth character. I had some ideas, but I had not said, as you watch at the end of that Cyclops video, I had not guaranteed which character that would be. Actually, at that time, I was considering doing Phoenix uh, or Jean Grey because I had Gambit and Rogue, so I do Cyclops and Phoenix or Jean Grey. But then I thought, you know what? I think because I did a, a Dark Phoenix just a few, a few videos back uh, during my Q&A post-it, I thought, you know what? I want to do a Bishop so that I could show the colors I use. A lot of people ask what colors I use for a darker skin tone. So I thought, you know, this would be a good opportunity to do that. And I don't often get to draw Bishop and people really like Bishop. He's a really cool character. So um, uh, that is uh, why I changed there. Ever draw a curved linear perspective for comic books? Um, I have not that I can recall because um, it uh, hasn't really been necessary or hasn't come up. Um, I'm not opposed to it. Um, I think it'd be fun to try and, and, and experiment with, absolutely. But I can't recall having used curvilinear uh, perspective in a comic book. Walden Wong's channel shows how to refill microns. 
Really? I'll have to check that out. I didn't know there was a, a way to refill these. Huh. I buy, I buy mine by the box fill. Let's see. Do school grades matter when you're trying to work in Marvel or comic companies? Um, I will say this. I, I did well in school. Uh, in, in, I did pretty well in high school. Did well in art school. I had good marks. But, and I graduated with an Associate of Applied Arts degree, but I will say this. When I broke into the comics, whether it would be working for Rob Liefeld's Extreme Studios, DC Comics, Marvel Comics, working for Robert Kirkman on Invincible Universe, no one asked, what is your degree? What was your grade point average? No one has ever asked that. They have asked, what they have wanted to see is, can you draw and tell a story well? And can you meet deadlines? It's, so that is key, and that's what school is really preparing us for, um, at least in the world of comics, is can you draw and tell a story in, a, in an interesting uh, manner? Uh, is, it, is, it, you know, is there a strength to your art there? Uh, can you convey it? Can you move the camera around? How are your design capabilities? It's what are you going to bring to the table? And um, oftentimes our grades can reflect what we've learned, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that translates in the real world. So th that's why it's, I say we study all the time, we practice all the time. I graduated back in 1992 from art school. So it's been a long time. I'm old. Uh, but I'm still learning. I'm still trying new things. I'm still learning new things. I'm still studying the things I know to try to level up in new ways, in different ways, to find new and different ways to draw things. So I would say as long as we're continuing to try to teach ourselves, learn, study, level up, then we'll hopefully be growing in our skills and those skills are leveling up so hopefully that hopefully that answer helps you um, is really it, it <laughs> we don't stop learning when we graduate school i'll tell you that much we don't stop learning there's always more to learn in so many aspects of our life not just our career do i specialize in doing caricatures uh no not your traditional caricature like you'll th see it like a like at a disneyland or a theme park uh, where you have the big head and the little little body on a surfboard or, or roller skating. I don't do those kinds of caricatures. I'm not opposed to it. I think it's amazing. I love to watch those artists work. I am just not trained in seeing a person's features in that way where you exaggerate it in, a, in an interesting or uh, appealing way um, and sometimes a comedic way. I haven't really studied that. That's a different skill set. I'm more about straight up traditional western superhero comics this is my favorite flavor and my jam and what i've uh, pursued in my art career maybe someday i'll become a caricature artist i don't know uh, but right now that hasn't been something i've pursued i feel a sneeze coming on my apologies gang oh man ah uh, have i ever drawn spawn yes in fact i have a three-part spawn series a video series here on my channel so just search Todd Knox Spawn you can see the pencils the inks and the colors so yes I have drawn a Spawn video and you can watch it Stranger Things characters at some point I'll probably do some of those oh I need an exacto knife to refill the the microns well I do have an exacto knife now for me it's like the uh the cost efficiency of time to spend to refill Copics does it is it is it cost effective for me in the long run in the time I spend or is it is it more cost effective for me just to toss the old marker grab the new one and go so I definitely want to watch that Walden Wong's video I know Walden he's a, a great guy fantastic inker I'm sure I'm gonna learn a lot of stuff from his channel uh, and his video there so I look forward to checking that out see what I learn and see is it beneficial for me to to refill Copics or is it gonna slow me down too much so um, uh, definitely something to keep in mind. Thank you so much for that tip. I'm really excited to check out those videos and see what I can learn. Do I have a personal project of comics with my own characters and stories? Absolutely. It's called Wild Guard. W-I-L-D-G-U-A-R-D. I did 12 issues of this made-for-TV superhero team series. Uh, I published it at Image Comics in 2003 and 2009. Haven't really done any new stories since then, but I am working on a new one-shot story that I'm doing just for fun that I'm completely penciling, inking, and coloring digitally. And uh, I'm maybe... A, about a third of the way through producing that and I work on that when I have free time amidst my Marvel deadlines and my convention travel. So we'll tackle a couple more questions. Oh my gosh, we've been going for about an hour and a half here. 
Let's see. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Aaron Wright, you're, so you're lightening up the Q&A with a non-art question. Does it make me uncomfortable that that you are watching this in the shower? Uh, I don't want to know any more <laughs> about <laughs> what, where you're at, what's going on right now. I'm imagining you're cleaning the shower. You're fully clothed. You've got the rubber gloves. You've got the uh, scrubbing bubbles and you know the, the scouring pad. And you have this on, off to the side, and you're cleaning the the, the shower and you know you're, you're using the Tylex and a squeegee and you've got you know your old grubby cleaning clothes on that's what I'm imagining and I'm not uncomfortable at all and we're gonna leave it at that <laughs> thanks for trying to lighten up the Q&A for giving us a very different and creative question I, I that you get you get uh, bonus points for that do does, does image comics still prefer, pre preserve artist ownership of characters um, I haven't worked with image comics since uh, or done a creator own uh, comic with image since 2009 so I don't know if they've changed I don't think they have you would think that if they 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 were taking away the rights of the the creators that that would be big news so I'm assuming more than likely that they are all still about creators own the copyrights and trademarks to their characters flat out 100% um, at least that's what my contracts say from when I did my book, my Wild Guard series with Image uh, all those years ago. So, uh, so I don't think things have changed. Like I said, if, if they had made sort of change, some change where own Image starts to own a portion of, of cre creations, you would think that'd be par fairly big news in the comic industry considering it's a change from what Image Comics was founded on, and that is creators own their creations 100%. Have I tried Autodesk Sketchbook for digital since they have actual Copic pens in their software? I have not. I am interested in learning more about that. Thank you so much for the tip. Could I do a how-to on digital art? Yes, I do plan on doing that at some point. Just haven't had the time. I need to experiment on how I would make that work. Do I broadcast directly from my tablet or do I do the camera, pardon me, over the shoulder? So, um, so I'll probably experiment with broadcasting directly from the tablet so you're seeing the tablet so you're seeing the screen capture uh, of the tablet um, is my initial thought is there a type of paper board I refuse to draw on yes yes there is there are some of the earliest sketch covers the comic the sketch cover uh, blank covers that, that are out there that you can get at a comic shop and then you can get an artist to draw or you yourself can draw on the, the cover those blank covers in the early days, Marvel was the first people into the game, first publisher in on that game, and some of the, the covers the stock they used before 2014, 2014, is too glossy. It's too slick. It, it, it makes a mess. Some are super bad, like some of the Secret Invasion ones, so bad, you can barely even pencil on it. And then after 2014, they learned to use this Strathmore uh, type of paper stock. Bristol paper stock instead of the glossy. Glossy can look nice, but for a printed cover, not for drawing on. So those I will not draw on. If someone brings a, a glossy sketch cover to me to get a commission on at a convention, and I can tell, oh, this is 2012, it's too glossy, I hand it back, I go, it's not gonna look good. It's it's just, this is bad paper stock. I, I personally don't want to draw on it because it's just not gonna, it's not just not gonna work out right. I said, if you have one that's from 2014 or to present, Let's go, let's rock, let's get it hopping and popping. But those slick ones, I don't like them. Don't buy them for myself either. Just not, not so great. If you're an inspir uh, aspiring artist going to San Diego Comic-Con, what would be ideal thing to take with you? Sketchbooks, portfolios, or both? Uh, whatever you can um, comfortably carry with you throughout the day. Um, if you're trying to break in, absolutely. Have your portfolio of your sample sequential art, your 11 by 17 artwork. You don't have to bring tons of art. You don't have to fill out every page in the portfolio. Editors don't have time to look at every page. If you can have three to six pages, no more than eight really, of sequential art, pinups, cover type images, it's okay to have some of those in there, but editors are gonna wanna see can you tell a story? So you want that sequential art in there. So bring that. Your sketchbook, unless you're going to go get sketches from commissioned, you know, commissioned sketches from artists, sure, you can bring that. But you don't necessarily need to bring a sketchbook to show an editor because, again, as I said, they're going to want to see your sequential art. Maybe have some sequential art packets 
where you've taken your, your sequential art, you've made eight and a half by 11 photocopies and you make these little bound packets. You know, you can just get the little slip cover things, put your pages in there, put the little binder slip on there. They're like, what, 50, 60 cents, a dollar at, at, at our, our office supply store. So you have these with your name and email address on every page, every photocopy because it's not always guaranteed that every page of your sample packet will make it back to the publisher's office, the editor's office. Sometimes they get torn apart just because they're in the hurried packing or all, all the stuff they are given. So they might get back with page three of your four page packet. But your name and uh, an email address were only on page one. And they're going, oh, this art, I remember this artist. I really like this artist. He or she did, was really cool to talk to. I want to hire them. I don't, know, I don't know their name. I don't remember their name. I met so many people. I don't have their contact info. Oh well, hopefully I'll meet him again someday. Move on to the next person, next artist. So make sure your name and email address is on the front or back of each photocopy. That is key. Have your contact info on every, every page uh, so that you don't miss out on a possible opportunity. Um, so, and then just bring a handful of those. You know, if you're making some Marvel packets, make up maybe five or six Marvel packets, five or six DC packets that you can hand off. Because these are only three or four photocopied pages, so you're not bringing a, bringing a big ream of paper. You're just bringing what you can comfortably carry for that day. Because I got to tell you, San Diego Comic Con is exhausting, especially when you're up and walking around all day, every day. So, wear comfortable shoes, drink lots of water and don't carry too much stuff every day because it will wear you down. Uh, bring what, what you desperately need uh, to, to um, get through the day and hopefully um, meet with some editors and show your portfolios. Now, along those lines, this goes for, you know, mostly it's the, these, the major conventions like San Diego, New York, Seattle, Chicago. Publishers, some publishers can look at your portfolio right then. Other publishers will have audition times, like where you drop off your samples and then they'll call you back. You check the next day for the callback sheet to see which edit, which artists the editors want to meet with. Every convention's different. Uh, every publisher's um, uh, portfolio review process is different. So check their website, send them a polite tweet asking, are you doing, is your, is your company doing uh, portfolio reviews. Will you have editors there doing portfolio reviews? If so, what days, where, what's the procedure? I'd like to, you know, see if I can get my portfolio looked at. Back when I was breaking in, in, in before comics really, blew, comic cons really blew up, it was easier to show off portfolios. I could go to a Dallas convention, walk up to the Marvel table and ask, is there an editor I can show my portfolio? And I'd get to, a chance to look, get two or three editors to look at my portfolio and get their critiques. And it was, so beneficial. I even did that New York Comic Con back in 1993, January 93, fresh out of art school. My dad and I drove out to New York Comic Con. I had my Marvel and my DC sample pages. I didn't have tons of each, just I think a five, three, two, three page sequences of each, uh, for each company. I had like a, uh, I had a, like a Namor, uh, Power Man, Iron Fist uh, three pager, and I think like a Spider Man three pager, and then I had like a Justice League three pager and a Green Lantern three pager. And so I took these to the convention, shouldered my way up to the front of the line, to the table, and got some editors to, you know, it's like, hey, could, and I knew which editors were going to be there. Or I recognized their names. I studied who are the editors that are working in the industry. I knew their names. So when I saw them, I was like, Mr. Nice, he has a Deadpool and uh, he gave me his card. He goes, send me a and I will mail you some uh, some sample scripts. And that's why I started working on it. He sent me uh, a, a sample script of X-Men, Nomad, and Wonder Man. So, of course, I started with the X-Men. He sent them back with critiques. I was working on the Wonder Man one, and wouldn't you know, that's when Rob Liefeld discovered me and I got hired full-time. So it's like, this is huge. So, um, so I really, uh, and I even had a chance to uh, meet with Fabian here all these years later and say, you took a shot on me. You gave me, a, you were giving me tryouts. You know, I ended up going to work at Extreme Studios, but thank you for all that you, you know, you, you did to invest in me. You know, that, that didn't go unnoticed and, you know, you're, you're part of my origin story. And uh, he was really cool, really appreciative. He goes, yeah, he goes, I saw a lot of potential in you. I says, I'm so glad it worked out for you and, um, you know, glad we're, you know, able to work in the same industry together. So you just never know who you're going to meet, what opportunities are going to come your way. Uh, but it all depends on the conventions. And now that things are so much different, conventions are so much bigger, so many people trying to break in, so many people want their uh, portfolio seen at especially... 
an enormous con like San Diego Comic Con and New York Comic Con. It's research ahead of time. Do the research ahead of time. You've got, what, four, five days before the convention? Start today. Start looking at Marvels and DCs and Dark Horse and Image Comics and uh, all the publishers. I think all the publishers will be there. Antarctic Press or New England Comics or uh, Top Cow, uh, IDW, boom. Check out their Twitter feed. Check out their website. Ask them questions. Reply to their, they posted about their convention, reply with a kind tweet. Be polite, be professional, and see what they say. They might send you a direct link. They might not respond at all. I don't know what's going on on their end. You know, you just never know. But reach out to them. See what information you can find. Um, do that legwork ahead of time. It will hopefully make your convention experience more hopefully productive. That you'll be able to meet with the people you hope to meet with. You'll come away with some sort of information. You know, whether it's a, a critique or maybe an opportunity to do some tryouts, like like I got to experience when I was younger. Uh, you just, just never know. Um, but and, and that's the thing, when you go into these conventions, go in with low expectations, just hope for the best and, and see what you come away with. Because um, you might not come away with a job. It's rare that people come away with a job, but some people do, you just never know. But the thing is, you gotta be in the game. So it sounds like you're in the game, you're, you're, you're getting ready to go play, and I wish you all the best. Long answer to that question, but there's a lot of information that um, people ask about, so I figured this was a great opportunity to share that, especially with San Diego Com Comic Con coming up next week and New York Comic Con coming up in October. And if you plan to be at New York Comic Con, start working on your portfolio today or this week. Start working on it now. Start building it. Start getting things ready uh, so that you have your work ready to go. You've got time to really invest in your work. Uh, as opposed to waiting till like the week of, and now I want to try to create eight pages. It's like, if you're not trained to do that, they're probably not going to be your eight, eight best pages. So things to keep in mind. Let's tackle a couple more questions and I need to sign off here, gang. Let's see, a lot of questions here about Copic markers. They are kind of expensive, yes, that is true, but they are, so far from what I've seen, some of the best quality markers. Let's see, you do live streams from your studio for digital art, and if I want any advice on the setup or anything to stream my digital art, feel free to hit you up. Well, I appreciate that, Create My Comic. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, let's tackle just one more, two. Let's see, all right, I saw some of those questions. I caught up to where I was. Um, let's see. You'd like me to see, see me draw RoboCop? New Era versus Old Era. Interesting, interesting. Agent Venom? Very possibly. I have drawn Agent Venom in uh, some fill-in pages on, uh, I did some fill-in work with Nick Bradshaw on Guardians of the Galaxy about five years ago, where I got to draw some Agent Venom, Space Venom. All right. Who would win, Spider-Man or Batman? We'll end on this. Who would win, Spider-Man or Batman? <sighs> you know, that's tough. That is tough. Um, both bring incredible skills and experience to the to the battle. I think many of us would assume Batman would, just because he's such a tough guy. You know, he 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 is grizzled. You know, he he's hardened, and uh, you know he can really be. And then with all of his gadgets and knowledge, he's really tough to beat. But Spider-Man, even though he has the stronger than Spider-Man, but Spider-Man, he's the underdog. And he perseveres and he endures. Even when the sorry Batman fans win, I don't know. There's a lot of other factors to consider. Who am I going to root for? I got to root for my homie Spider-Man just because he's my homie. But I do enjoy Batman and I do wish him all the best. <laughs> Gang, thanks so much. Thanks so much for hanging out. This will be posted here on my uh, social media here real soon. Thanks so much for spending the afternoon with me. Hopefully you had fun. Hopefully you learned something. And um, hopefully if you're coming to San Diego Comic Con, I'll see you at Gabe El Taib's Comic Kickoff Party. 9 p.m. Basic uh, Pizza and Bar in downtown San Diego, just minutes from, from the convention center. 9 p.m. is when it opens. Free admission. It's a 21 and over party. And bring your cash so you can buy raffle tickets and hopefully play some bids on some of these illustrations. And all the money goes to benefit the Hero Initiative, a really great charity. Check them out at heroinitiative.org to learn more about what they do and for the how they help out comic comic creators in their golden years to uh, you know to to live and 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 pay for. 
the, you know, rent, mortgage, grocery or other bills or uh, hospital bills. So gang, thanks so much. Wish you all the best. Keep on drawing. Keep having fun.